like every time I go to work, I was getting very stressed thinking about like, am I gonna have to fight somebody today? Okay, hello my friends. Welcome back to my channel. If you are brand new here on this channel, we normally talk about health, wellness, and personal development. But today I am talking about a little something different just to give a life update. So if you are interested in this topic, definitely stick around. And if you are just a returning subscriber who is probably an actual friend of mine, uh, I know you've probably been wanting to know the answer to this question. Why did I leave my flight attending job? A few things that I need to talk about real quick. One, I cannot name the name of the company that I worked for. Um, because they have a really strict social media policy and I don't want to get sued. So in this video, we're going to be calling them Schmelta. And um, also there's another like hot keyword that I don't know if YouTube flags. So I'm going to put it right here on the screen and I'm just going to tell you that we're going to refer to this as the pandemonium. Okay. If you're someone who's looking at possibly getting into the airline industry and you just want to know why someone would leave, or if you're currently in the airline industry and you're looking to see like, what did you do in this situation? Stick around. This video is for you. So the very first reason that I wanted to leave is very personal to me and you may not relate to this unless you are a mom as well. But for me, my son started to develop some interesting behavior situations. <laughs> Um, first of all, he was like rejecting his dad when I was home. So, um, if Atlas, my son, name is Atlas, if he was like eating food and dropped like a piece of food on the floor, if his dad went to like pick it up, he'd be like, no daddy, get it. Mommy, get it. I also had to always be the one who like fed him. I had to always be the one who gave him a bath. I had to do bedtime routine every single night. And not that I don't love doing that stuff, but it would be nice to take turns so that we could like, you know, balance house chores. Like it's not fair that he has to do dishes every single night because I'm busy putting the baby to bed. Like I'll do dishes sometimes and you can put the baby to bed. And like <sighs> Atlas was just completely like, daddy don't carry me, daddy don't do this. Like I don't want to be with daddy, I wanna be with mommy. So that is reason number one. Reason number two has to deal with my schedule. This might be more relevant to you if you are single or just interested in how like the flight attending schedules work. But if you don't already know this, flight attending schedules are assigned based on seniority. So the top most senior people who have been with the airline the longest get the best schedules. Now, one man's trash is another man's treasure in the scheduling department. Some people want to fly every weekend. Some people do not want to fly on the weekends. But in my case, my home life situation had a lot to do with my schedule desires as well. My husband worked from home. He had a desk in our living room and that meant that my son could not be home during the week because having him there would be a distraction to his work process. So. During the week, my son had to go to daycare and I could not hold weekends off. The only times that I would see him would be to get him up in the morning, take him to school, and then when my husband was done working that day, I would pick him up, make him dinner, bath, books, bed. And then on the weekends I was gone because I couldn't hold weekends off because I was too junior. Also, another thing that was like kind of unfair was that my husband ended up being solely responsible 100% for my son every single weekend by himself. And he didn't sign up to be a single parent. Like being a parent of a particularly crazy, energetic toddler, um, you know, I mean, sometimes it really does take two people. So if you're single and you plan on being somebody who's gonna date, you are gonna have a hard time finding dates in the week because you're gonna be working the weekends, I promise you. And you're gonna be gone, and all of your fun family activities, all of the friend meetups, you're not gonna be there. And I just really couldn't see myself not being able to do those like fun activities with my son and like be there for his 
find like extracurricular activities and be a fun supportive mom in that way um, okay so moving on to reason number three was the quality of my trips um, again like this is gonna kind of go back to relationships but I definitely want to touch on this, okay? Um, I want to make this very clear and understood. Um, when people come to this industry, they think that they're going to be doing a lot of really amazing trips. But as I said in the last point, your trips are assigned to you based on seniority. So the people who have had 40, 50 years in the, in the company, they're going to put in their bid and they're going to receive what they asked for. And then everybody else is just kind of trying to hang on to whatever they can get. And then you rely a lot on the swap board to change out your trips if you can. Now, um, for me, that meant that I worked a pretty standard like three days on, three days off, three days on, three days off, and then six days on call somewhere in between there. So I mostly got domestic routes and I would work mostly like 12 hour work days, which I'm legal for 15. I will give more insight into that little detail in a moment. You're not likely going to be going to Paris. You're not likely gonna be going to Tel Aviv. You're not likely going to Sydney. I mean, at least not on one of the carriers like I was on where we have domestic and international routes um, in the United States. If you're on an international carrier, I think that that's a different story, but you know, talking about my airline and other airlines like my airline, someone's got to do those domestics and they're going to the most junior people. So those junior people like me are going to be flying to like Cincinnati and then, you know, and then they're going to make a stop in like Charlotte and then they're going to make a stop in like, I don't know, Salt Lake City. And then you might spend the night in Salt Lake City. And then the next day you're gonna wake up and you're gonna do it all over again. And you might get some really cool trips in there. And actually, I'm so glad that I worked trips like that because I found that I love the landscape of the United States so much. And I wouldn't have known that had I not had this job. I found so much more appreciation for my country. However, um, you could potentially get some really great international trips if you are on call. Um, because, you know, let's say like you are on call and um, someone and you're like next on the list and someone who is going to like, let's say Amsterdam calls out sick, you would get that trip. And yes, you could go to Amsterdam, but on your general schedule, you're not going to be going to Amsterdam. You could pick up Amsterdam in your off time and go then, but... I always felt so overworked that um, I didn't want to pick up more hours in my off time. Um, so let's go ahead and get into that overworked time. We're going to talk about legalities for just a moment, okay? And like just what a pain in the ass it can be. So I was based in Atlanta and I lived in Alabama, which my city was about a two hour drive. and there's a one hour time change driving from Alabama to Georgia. So, um, like let's say for example, my report time for a trip was at six in the morning. Two hours prior to that is 4 a.m. but there's a one hour time change so that's 3 a.m. my time and then I give myself an extra hour for traffic just in case so that's 2 a.m. That means I have to leave my house by 2 a.m to get to work by 6 a.m. And then from that point, I'm legal for 15 hours. So let's just not count that one hour time change. That's an 18 hour day for me. It was really tough and I was exhausted all the time. I would get to my layover hotels and the whites of my eyes would be like bloodshot red. I mean, I was very, very exhausted. I will say though that most of the time the airline does try to avoid giving you a maximum duty day. They don't always just hand you a 15 hour day every single time you're on a rotation. But 
things happen, delays happen, reroutes happen, and you could, like, you signed up for that. You don't get to keep every single trip that you have. So, you know, you have to be flexible, but at the same time, like, once you get to that 15 hours, you have to make a choice. Like, am I gonna work and get paid extra and risk, like, blowing a slide or, you know, having some kind of medical emergency that I'm not mentally prepared for or something like that and you know or should I take the time off and know that I'm going to be flown into my off day and be rerouted and they're going to ask me to work 15 hours again tomorrow and it's it's a lot it's a lot so let's move into what the job really is because this is a major point for me we spend typically six to eight weeks in training. I spent eight weeks in training. Um, and we are not going over how to pour a soda. We are really not going over how to hand out cookies. <laughs> we are going over life and death scenarios. We're, we're learning how to evacuate an aircraft in 90 seconds or less in the case of an emergency landing on land or water. We're learning how to fight fires. We're learning to do CPR. We're learning how to administer oxygen. We really are doing so much more than people think. And it's, it's irritating to be so taken for granted and not only taken for granted, but taken advantage of. For example, I have to be on the aircraft five minutes prior to boarding. But in those five minutes, I'm supposed to be prepping the galley and preparing the plane for everyone to come on. And I'm also supposed to be checking my safety equipment. So that is to make sure that everything is, appears to be working properly, okay, in case of an emergency. And these gate agents will come at you and be like, can we board early? I'm like, no, because five minutes is barely enough time to get that done anyway. Another example is like some passenger interactions that I've had where people have been so crazy or just rude. Um, for example, when the mask mandate was just beginning, my airline had stopped blocking the middle seats and they started filling every single seat again. I had a passenger in the window seat hit the call light. So I come over and I'm like, hey, what can I do to help you? And he's like, pointing at the guy in the middle's face and he's like the guy in the middle just you know for reference is wearing like a ski mask in May and it like it's it's literally like a toboggan with like the eyes cut out you know so he's got it like pulled up over his face it completely like comes down his head and then there's like this so that's his mask and then he pulls it down so the guy in the window rings the call light and I come over and I'm like hey what's what's going on like we're during boarding and he's like pointing at the guy's face his finger is like this in the guy's face and he's like hey is this what you guys count as wearing a mask this is acceptable to you I mean what are we doing here and he's just going on and on and I look at the guy and he's of course not wearing his mask because it's May and he's wearing winter gear and he's like, man, it's hot on this plane. I can't believe you're even saying this. So I look at the two of them and I'm trying to think, how can I deescalate? Cause window guy is being pretty aggressive and middle guy is like not really wanting to comply with the mask mandate. So I'm like, hey, you're gonna have to wear your mask. Like, sorry, you chose winter gear, but like I can get you a mask or you can wear the one you brought but you are going to have to comply and you get your finger out of his face, okay? So I take care of that situation and I walk back to the galley and as I walk back, I see the guy out of the corner of my eye, like pull his mask back down. <laughs> and they start fully having an argument with like curse words and like they're getting angry at each other and I'm like, are you serious right now? So, that situation only really de-escalated because two other passengers offered to switch their seats. 
but that just felt a little bit dangerous because it was the first time that I had experienced passengers arguing with each other on the plane. And, you know, we had a brand new set of clientele. So prior to the pandemonium, we pretty much catered to corporate accounts. Of course, we flew everyone. Anyone who bought a ticket can buy a ticket, but we had a lot of corporate accounts, which basically means that their company is paying for that passenger to travel. We had a lot of really, mm, you just tend to behave better when you are there for work. Like your behavior is gonna be reported back, obviously and your corporate account could be in jeopardy if you cause a lot of drama on the plane. So people who fly very often know what to expect and they know how to behave, but people who don't fly very often, uh, they don't know what to expect, they're confused, they're frustrated, they're stressed, and they don't know how to behave. Um, so that was my first like experience with that. Then I had two women get into an argument because one of them was offended that the second woman was putting her luggage in the overhead bin space above her seat. She starts going off on her like, I don't even know why you tried to put your stuff in my overhead bin when I'm standing right here and you can see that I'm about to use it and this is not your space, this is my space, blah, blah, blah. What a fiasco. First of all, the overhead bin space is first come first serve. Just because it's above your seat doesn't mean it belongs to you. And second of all, I can't believe you're willing to argue with a complete stranger over this. But that's fine. And I thought that the situation had like come down a bit, but upon landing, they started to argue again over a different topic that had nothing to do with the overhead bin space. Um, and at this point, like the landing gear is out and we're about to land and the two of them are up arguing. And so I yelled at them and I was like, both of you sit down and stop talking or I'm going to have security meet this flight at the airport. And the woman who like instigated all of it got like really in my face and was like, don't you threaten me. And I was like, Girl, it's not a threat. You are threatening me by being in my space. You are threatening this woman by com completely yelling and cursing at her. I will have you arrested. Sit down and don't try me. So, <laughs> by this point, I'm like, I'm really starting to feel like every time I go to work, I was getting very stressed thinking about like, <laughs> am I gonna have to fight somebody today? Mm. We also had two very dangerous like scenarios that I don't think I'm allowed to talk about happen um, that like had happened around the same time and was not on my flights but on somebody else's flights and they were just really scary scenarios so I was like just very tense. I was stressed. I was constantly thinking about like what could happen on my flights. Then we have this rule about people who come onto the plane who appear to be intoxicated because we were not really allowed to say that they are intoxicated because they might actually be disabled or have something, you know, going on with them uh, emotionally. So we say they appear to be intoxicated, but I had one individual who was completely intoxicated and, um, we were on a red-eye flight from LA going to Atlanta and um, we he actually didn't make a scene when he came on the flight, no one noticed him. Um, he slept through the service, so no one served him any alcohol. But about three hours into the flight, he woke up and he came to the back of the aircraft. Now this aircraft, I believe was a 75Y. Um, I will see if I can find a diagram and put it right here. Um, but basically it's a narrow body, but long plane holds a lot of people. So, um, in the configuration that we have, there are no restrooms in the back of the plane. They're actually at the three door. The plane has eight doors, like 
one here or two here, two here, two here, two here. Um, but the labs are at the three door instead of in the back of the plane. So I know that that's confusing and the person was sitting in what I like to call the caboose um, from the three door to the four door and he was sitting in that area. So he got up and came to the back of the plane as many people do and looked around and was like, uh, where's the bathroom? And at this point in the flight, uh, we've done our work and we're kind of just taking a, a break. And you know, one of the flight attendants is like, it's right behind you at the three door. You'll see the lights turn around. And he just kind of stood there looking around strangely. And we were like, sir, are you okay? Uh, I need the bathroom. Okay, well, it's, it's right behind you. If you'll just turn around, you'll see the lights, the symbols for the bathroom. It's back there. Just turn around and walk back. And he's like, and he starts leaning closer and closer. And I'm sitting like right here. Here's the door. Here's the galley like countertop. And I'm sitting in the jump seat and he faints into my lap, hits his head on the slide bustle, which if you don't know, is the part of the compartment on the aircraft door that holds the slide. In case of an emergency, we would deploy the slide and it would allow you to jump out of the plane and slide to safety. So he hits his head on that and just passes out in my lap. And when he comes to, you can smell it on his breath. He's completely, completely drunk, like super, super strong. Anyway, the point is that situation was just a little bit scary. I also had right after that on the same route coming from LA, you could smell in that hole back at the caboose area. So, you know, I figured out who it was and I was like, hey, I don't think we should go because we need to get this guy who smells of off the plane. First of all, he's stinking up the entire back of the aircraft. Second of all, I'm really not comfortable with flying any passengers who are intoxicated. Keep in mind, we're not supposed to. We are not supposed to, like you cannot come on an aircraft already intoxicated. We do not have to fly you. And even if you go, oh, please, I'll behave. I won't be a problem. You don't know you're gonna be a problem before you become a problem. Sometimes you have a medical emergency that you can't foresee and it's a problem. I don't, like after the situation that I encountered with the guy passing out on my lap, I really didn't feel comfortable flying with anybody else who was intoxicated. That's just how I felt. Um, so, you know, one of the other flight attendants was like, oh, it's LA, it's legal here. And I was like, sure, 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 it's legal here. But like our company policy says that, you know, if they're showing like two or more signs and the signs are listed in our onboard manual, like this might be intoxication, this might be intoxication, this might be intoxication. If you're exhibiting signs of two or more of those, then you have the right to get those people off the aircraft. So one of the flight attendants is like, no, it's fine. And then one of the other flight attendants was like, I think it's a problem too. So we get the flight leader and the flight leader was just absolutely like not a great person. Um, he was just like <laughs> absolutely not a great flight leader. He A, like didn't have your back. And also I caught him hiding in the forward closet. So then like we get the flight leader involved and he comes back and he like, he's like, I don't smell anything. I was like, you're just lying. Like you're full on lying. We call the captain. We're like, yeah, like the flight leader says it's fine because he can't smell it, but the whole like back of the plane stinks. So the, pi the pilot's like, well, the flight leader's fine with it. I'm fine with it. You know, it ended up not being a problem at all, but I still stand by the fact that that passenger should not have been on the plane. <sighs> I have also just had like people be rude 
like in general, they're rude. I had a guy, I was on the cart with this girl and we were doing um, what we call an express service. So if you're not familiar with that, that basically means the flight is under a certain mileage and the airline wants us to get through the whole cabin. So instead of serving everything we would normally serve, we only serve coffee, tea, and water. Alcohol is available for people in the plus cabin. It comes with their ticket. They don't have to purchase it. It's just included. Um, so we get to the main cabin and this guy asks my partner on the, the cart if he can have a beer. And she says, oh, I'm sorry. We don't serve beer in the main cabin on these flights. They're too short. And she explains the whole thing. And he says, okay, I'll have a water. And then at that point, it was time for us to roll backwards. So I ended up being the person who served him. And I said, hey, I heard you tell her that you would like a water. Let me get that for you. And he goes, actually, I wanted a beer, but she told me no. And then I explained exactly what she had just said to him. And at this point, I've handed him his water and I'm asking the other people in his row, what would you like? What would you like? And he's like, I was delayed 14 hours and I'm miserable and I can't believe you guys are gonna not serve beer on this 40 minute flight to Richmond. <laughs> and I was just like, it's, I'm sorry, like it's not available. At this point, he's interrupting me, um, keeping me from moving on with my work. And I was just like, I'm gonna just stop what I'm doing and look him in the eye. So I'm like, Sir, is there anything in particular that I can do about your delayed flight? Which, by the way, was a lie. And he thinks that I don't know that, but I can look in your file on my like work device and see like where you came from, what's happened with you today, like what your flights are like. I can see all of that. It wasn't even true. And even if it was true, if you've been in the airport, then you have all the time in the world to go to any restaurant and order a beer. Just saying. Anyways, I just looked at him in the eye. Is there anything personally I can do about your delayed flight? Yeah, you can get me a beer. And I, I was just stunned that he talked to me like that. So I just said, no, and moved on. And he said, I didn't know you were gonna be such a bitch. I immediately called the captain and asked him to have um, like what we call a red coat. And those people are supposed to be like customer service specialists and have them meet the flight. And I just want you to know that that did not happen because it was the last flight of the night and no red coats were on duty. So he got away with it. <sighs> On top of all the people, like, while you're, you know, serving food, they're trying to hand you their trash and, like, you don't have gloves on. I just want you guys to realize, like, you guys will come off the plane and thank the captain for such a wonderful flight. But let me tell you something. Flight attendants are the people who make your flight nice. And also, if there was an emergency, let's just pretend like you had an emergency landing and you had to evacuate the aircraft. Here's a secret. The pilots aren't coming out to help you. They have an escape path from the flight deck and they won't even open that door. They are not coming out to save you. Who's gonna save you? Flight attendants. Mic drop. I think that deserves a little respect. So now that I have pretty much told you all the reasons why I decided to leave, here are a few reasons why working in the airline industry is actually really great. Obviously, the best thing is the flight benefits. At my company, me, my husband, my child, my mom, and my dad could all fly for free. I mean, you do have to fly standby. That's like a caveat that you need to know. Flying standby means that you don't actually pay for your seat, so they're gonna continue selling tickets until the very last moment. So that means that you may or may not have a seat on the flight you want, 
but if you don't get on that one, then you'll be rolled over to the next flight to your destination and eventually you'll make it to where you wanna go, but it is really nice because you can fly for free. Another really cool thing is that if you wanna go somewhere that your airline doesn't fly, there's a really great program out there that allows you to what we call interline travel. So you can pay to fly on another airline but it'll be like greatly reduced price. They also have the ID90 travel website, which also gives you really great discounts on hotels. And I think that that is really worth it. The insurance available, I think it's pretty standard across the board that we don't have the greatest insurance benefits, but they're okay. Um, my favorite benefit besides the flight benefits was my 401k. They had like um, a match and a gift. So what that meant was they, like at my airline it was 6%. So, so whatever you normally make in a paycheck, you wanna put 6% of that into your 401k. Because you met their match, they will also put 6% in. So you doubled your money. Then on top of that, just for meeting the match, they gave you an extra 3%. So you got free money. It was nice. I haven't seen very many other companies do things like that. So it was very unique. Probably one of the few benefits of working for a really big company. And yeah, totally worth it. My 401k is killing it. All in all, I don't regret my time at the airline. I got to see some really great cities that I never would have gone to without it. And I really enjoyed meeting all of my lovely airline coworkers. They're really some of the best people and I loved meeting new people all the time. I loved my layovers and I loved going to like the new city and walking around or sitting at the hotel bar and having a glass of wine or going to the beach or going to the pool. Like I love that stuff and I definitely wouldn't do it again. That's just how I feel. It was the most fun I never want to have again. I actually feel so much healthier, so much more rested and like I don't feel so sickly and tired all the time. I feel like I can actually make a difference in my health now, which is, as my subscribers, you know that that's really important to me. So here's to a new chapter of my life. I hope that you liked this video. If you found any insight, if I persuaded you to join up or if I persuaded you to leave, you know, leave a comment below. I definitely wanna hear your stories. And um, I wish you all the best of luck. And yeah, have a great day. And of course, a great life. And I'll see you in the next one when I explain why my husband and I moved to Turkey. Okay, bye.